Hello everybody, so I am Lorna Mayo Nessa and I'm a third year nursing student. This is the last video of a four-part video series where I talk about different topics. So I hope you keep on watching until the end and I hope you learn something. So yeah, if you want to know more, keep on watching. For this topic, we will be talking about hyperhomocystinemia and acquired thrombophilia. This will be a summary of the information that you need to know about hyperhomocystinemia and acquired thrombophilia. So first, what is hyperhomocystinemia? Let's dive into homocysteine first. So homocysteine is a sulfur-containing amino acid formed as a byproduct of methyl transfer reactions in methionine metabolism. It is catabolized into cysteine and methionine. So, hyperhomocysteinemia is a medical condition characterized by an abnormally high level of homocysteine in the blood. What are the causative factors of hyperhomocysteinemia? First is insufficient vitamin B6, B9, and B12, kidney problems or the failure to excrete homocysteine, or it can also be due to the patient's lifestyle, and genetics or the defect in the 5-MTHF reductase. So, what are the risk factors associated with the disease? First is kidney disease or kidney failure, certain medications, and genetics. How do we detect hyperhomocysteinemia? A CBC test can be done to determine levels of homocysteine present in the body. So, the classification of hyperhomocysteinemia can be categorized as follows. First is moderate, next is intermediate, third is severe. So, what are the signs and symptoms of elevated homocysteine? First, for vitamin B12 deficiency, there is pale skin, malaise, fatigue, tingling sensation in the periphery, dizziness, mouth sores, and frequent mood swings. For folate deficiency, there is fatigue, mouth sores, swelling of the tongue, and growth problems. For the other vitamin deficiency that could overlap with these diseases, muscle weakness or unsteady movements, shortness of breath, irregular heartbeat, mental confusion, forgetfulness, and weight loss. So, what is the pathophysiology of this disease? As you can see on the screen, there are different colored boxes again. For the etiology, the insufficient vitamin B6, B9, and B12, it causes a deficiency of cofactors in the remethylation or transsulfuration. This therefore instigates methionine synthase to use methylcobalamin, a vitamin B12 derivative, as a cofactor. Both the CBS and the cystathionase use pyridoxal phosphate, which is a vitamin B6 derivative, as a cofactor. On the other hand, on the right side of the screen, for the kidney problems, kidney fails to excrete the homocysteine. Therefore, methylenetetrate hydrofolate reductase uses flavin adenine dinucleotide, which is a riboflavin derivative, as a cofactor. So, continuation. For the genetics, the defect in 5-MTHF reductase causes a metabolic defect. This results in excess homocysteine entering the systemic circulation. On the other hand, genetic defects of MTHFR leads to impaired synthesis of MTHF, the first step in the synthesis of methionine. So as you can see on the right side, MTHF is basically methylene tetrahydrofolate. So MTHF in short because that is a mouthful. Okay, next. So the body is therefore unable to synthesize or break down homocysteine. This causes a number of mechanisms, such as first, the excess number of homocysteine present in the body causes toxic effects to the body. This can be seen as the paleness of the skin, weakness, fatigue, tingling sensations, dizziness, sores in the mouth, and or the tongue. This mechanism is therefore how hyperhomocysteinemia occurs and is diagnosed. So, if there is hyperhomocysteinemia, Homocysteine rapidly oxidizes in the presence of plasma. Therefore, free radical oxygen is produced and lipoprotein peroxidation occurs. Now, the lipoprotein peroxidation simultaneously stimulates the premature platelet activity. This causes what is known as acquired thrombophilia. Now, for the complications of hyperhomocysteinemia, complications could include osteoporosis, Parkinson's disease, dementia, myocardial infarction, stroke, cardiovascular diseases, 
epilepsy and end-stage renal disease. So, what are the management or treatment modalities of hyperhomocystinemia? For the medical management, there is a vitamin B supplement and antihypertensive drugs. For the treatment modality, needed vitamin replacements could be used and the provision of comfortable environment. So what are the nursing management or interventions for patients with hyperhomocystinemia? I will reiterate that these are just some and there could possibly be more interventions done for patients with hyperhomocystinemia. First is to assess and evaluate the homocysteine lowering interventions effectiveness. Supervise the patient's compliance to treatment regimen and provide a calm and quiet environment and avoid strenuous activities. So, what are the possible nursing diagnoses for patients with hyperhomocystinemia and acquired thrombophilia? First is fear related to unfamiliarity with physiologic condition, its treatment and management. Deficient knowledge related to unfamiliarity with the physiologic condition, its treatment and management. And risk for bleeding related to elevated homocysteine levels. These are just some, but there could be more nursing diagnosis for patients with hyperhomocystinemia and acquired thrombophilia. So, what is the outlook for patients with hyperhomocystinemia specifically? The prognosis depends on whether the illness is treated as early as possible or not. Treating it as early as possible and providing the most effective and efficient nursing management poses a good outcome. However, if left alone, dangerous complications could arise. Okay, let us move on to acquired thrombophilia. So what is the correlation between thrombophilia and hyperhomocystinemia? If, due to some factor, homocysteine is unable to be synthesized whether by genetic defects, organ failure, or vitamin deficiency, it is believed to be that high concentration of homocysteine in circulation is injurious to the blood vessels. So. How does hyperhomocystinemia contribute to thrombophilia? While in the systemic circulation, homocysteine, among other reactions, like inhibiting the synthetization of nitric oxide, causing a decrease in the dilating ability of the vessel, therefore causing damage, this therefore auto-oxidizes rapidly in the plasma. The free oxygen radicals produced initiates lipid peroxidation either in the endothelial plasma membrane or alongside lipoproteins. This simultaneously activates tyrosine and rocinase-dependent signaling pathways, which activates the platelets. So, a patient with hyperhomocystinemia have normal platelet shape and lifespan. However, with the presence of homocysteine, their activity is disrupted owing to the premature stimulation by the homocysteine present resulting in an altered clotting ability of the body. Thrombophilia in of itself does not need treatment. However, in order to avoid further complications, it is imperative to treat its underlying factor which is, in this case, hyperhomocystinemia. So basically, acquired thrombophilia can be due to KF or vitamin B deficiency. The patient may also be prescribed anticoagulants such as heparin for as needed scenarios while warfarin is for long-term treatment if needed and prescribed by the physician. So basically that is it for hyperhomocystinemia and acquired thrombophilia. Thank you for watching!